Mile High Stadium in sunny Denver, Colorado. Never before has a championship game been played here. Today, however, the Denver Broncos will try to capture their first title ever, squaring off against the defending Super Bowl champion Oakland Raiders. With the AFC Championship and a trip to Super Bowl XII on the line. Oakland hasn't lost in Denver since 1962, but today they'll have to face Orange Crush, code name for one of pro football's best defensive units, far and away the best in the NFL against the run. Today, however, Denver's principal task will be to stop Ken Stabler's talented core of receivers, a group made stronger this season by the emergence of Dave Casper as the best tight end in the business. Compounding Denver's problems is the questionable status of quarterback Craig Morton. A painful hip injury put Morton in the hospital much of the week, forcing him to miss all of Denver's practices. Such are the concerns of coach Red Miller and his Cinderella Denver Broncos as they prepare to meet the Oakland Raiders in the NFL Game of the Week. Lyle Alzado and the Orange Crush defense have towered above their AFC opponents all season long. Ken Stabler knew his team would have to run against the Broncos to win, but early results suggested it wouldn't be easy. On Oakland's first possession, Alzado and company forced the Raiders into retreat but a special team's blunder made it all for naught. When punter Ray Guy went down, Oakland had a first down. This time, Oakland did things their way, piecing together a 16-play drive that featured eight short yardage bursts by durable Pete Banizak. Then from the three, Errol Mann gave the Raiders that all-important first score. Thus did the Raiders place the burden on ailing Craig Morton. Having missed a week of practice, Morton appeared somewhat tentative and unsure. At the very least, his teammates were having problems with his cadence. A false start left the Broncos flustered. The Raiders pushed them aside like table scraps. But just when Denver's composure threatened to abandon them, Craig Morton collected his thoughts and regrouped his forces, responding with one of the game's most crucial plays. Seventy-four yards later, Haven Moses bounced along waiting for confirmation. Sure enough, it was a touchdown at a time when the Bronco offense had threatened to fold. Another look shows that Morton play faked, then looked left, hitting Moses in stride. Moses kept both feet in bounds, then high-stepped it home. It was an important series for the Broncos, for not only did it produce a score, but also it gave the Raider defense something to think about. If Oakland thought Craig Morton would be the Broncos' weak link, they were mistaken, for Craig Morton and the Broncos were alive and well. The Oakland Raiders invariably run and throw to the left more often than to the right. Thus, protecting Denver's lead became the responsibility of players such as cornerback Steve Foley, number 43. Denver's rush had yet to sack Mr. Stabler. It was up to the secondary to make the big plays, and Stabler was testing them. Steve Foley responded with a clutch performance. Not only did he shadow the speedy cliff branch deep, but he also registered some big hits in the short zones, taking away Stabler's left side options. Bo 
fully sound execution forced Oakland into a new line of attack. With the arrival of period two, Stabler turned Fred Bolitnikoff loose among Denver's prowling linebackers. The rewards came at considerable expense. Denver's linebackers hammered away, but even more painful was the end result of all that hard work. The upright became Denver's 12th man, denying Oakland a score that would have pulled them to within one. By period two, Denver's rush had discovered inroads into Oakland's sacred pass pocket. But Ken Stabler is truly one of pro football's class performers. Operating on gimpy knees, Stabler rolled away from trouble, then lofted a perfect pass to Cliff Branch. But like the rest of Oakland's first half drives, this one too came up empty. And worse, it produced the game's most serious casualty. Fred Bilitnikoff, one of Oakland's most seasoned big game performers, didn't survive this trip over the middle. Upon impact, the stylish 13-year veteran dislocated his shoulder, a severe loss to Oakland's controlled air game. Ken Stabler now faced the prospect of playing catch-up in the second half without his most trusted receiver. With a slim 7-3 lead, Craig Morton didn't want to create a turnover. On the other hand, conservative play calling might result in Denver's defense assuming too much of the burden. Thus, he opted for the middle road, opening period three with an effective swing pass to fullback Lonnie Perrin. Morton followed this play with another relatively safe call, a turn in to wide receiver Haven Moses. Moses, however, turned it into a big play, a 40-yarder that carried all the way to Oakland's 23-yard line. Denver now could increase its lead to seven, but usually dependable Jim Turner sliced his kick to the right. However, Oakland's reprieve was short-lived. On the very next play, Clarence Davis bobbled a handoff, and rookie lineman Bryson Manor came up with his biggest fumble recovery as a pro. The ball was marked dead at the Raiders' 17. A short out pass to tight end Riley Odoms advanced it to the two. The stage now was set for the game's most controversial play. Rookie running back Rob Lytle lost the football. The Raiders recovered. But to number 58, Monty Johnson's dismay, the officials had blown the ball dead. Oakland was stunned, and John Madden couldn't believe it. The end result, Craig Morton optioned the ball to fullback John Keyworth on the very next play as Denver rolled to a 14-3 lead. Raider fans will point to this third quarter exchange as a cruel turning point in their fortunes. Bronco fans will see it otherwise. Another angle shows that Morton just beat a blitzing Floyd Rice with his pitch out, thus clearing the avenue for Keyworth to score. What could have been a real disaster became a big moment for Bronco mania. Keyworth's score lifted the Broncos to an 11-point lead. Now the pressure really was on the Raiders. Yeah. 
Later in the third period, Denver got still another great break when number 57, Randy McClanahan, ran into putter Bucky Diltz. After Diltz located the penalty flag he thought he had earned, he looked downfield and saw yet another reason for applause. At the other end of his kick, Carl Garrett had fumbled and Denver recovered on the Oakland 27 with another chance to cash in an opponent's mistake. This has been the Broncos' specialty all season, getting a break and then capitalizing. But this time, they would come up short. Denver was unable to turn the turnover into points as Morton missed on three straight passes. And Turner missed his third straight field goal. Given a new life, the snake began hissing some spark into the Raider offense. And late in the third quarter, Stabler began finding tight end supreme Dave Casper in the seams of the Bronco pass coverage areas. Looking at what was only the second reception of the day for Casper from ground level, reveals that he had gone down to make the catch, was up off his left knee before Foley hit him, and was thus free to add yardage to a 26-yard reception. On the fourth quarter's second play, Stabler to Casper brought Oakland within four points just before Joe Rizzo put Casper down on the goal line. Casper was somewhat piqued at the treatment he was receiving, as all afternoon Rizzo and Tom Jackson took turns rocking and socking the brilliant tight end as he tried to release into his pass patterns and a repeat of Casper's fourth touchdown of the postseason tournament reveals that he and Stabler beat his tormentors. Stabler by dropping the ball over Jackson, number 57, Casper by beating Rizzo to the goal line. Casper's score came just 39 seconds into the fourth quarter, and coming so early it could hardly detract from the Broncos' claim to ownership of the final 15 minutes. Denver players claim they cannot be beaten with a game on the line in the fourth quarter, and maybe they can't be. On the first play, after the Raider touchdown, Morton combined with Jim Jensen for 20 yards. Looking at the play from ground level reveals that Morton unloaded an instant before a vicious double lick by linebacker number 39 Willie Hall and defensive end John Matusak. The contact left an already hurting Morton with a couple more sore spots, but today more than any day in his 13-year career, Craig Morton claimed his place among the elite quarterbacks. His physical courage was beyond reproach, and he showed his mental toughness with two crucial completions to clutch receiver Haven Moses, the first on a third and 22 play that gained 25 yards. Moses, too, would have the greatest day of his 10-year career. An end zone look at his 25-yard drive continuing reception points up a case of incredible concentration. Number 22, Jimmy Warren, had a shot at an interception, and the ball was tipped several times before Moses clutched the ball to his chest. All this while staying in bounds. Officials were right on the spot to verify that Moses had possession while in bounds. But two plays later, the Broncos found themselves in another third down pickle that Morton and Moses ate up. Football games hinge on third down plays, and receivers like Moses and his Oakland counterparts, Bolitnikoff, Branch, and Casper, excel in such situations, but they pay for it. Heading for a possible touchdown, Oakland linebacker Floyd Rice, number 52, 
sniffed out a reverse, chewed up Moses, and spit out a 10-yard loss. The lost yardage put the Broncos in still another third down spot, but this time Morton was unable to connect and Rice intercepted his underthrown pass before he leveled Moses again. Rice has played excellent football since coming in when Phil Villapiano was lost for the season with an injury. With Rice's help, the Raiders had fought off what could have been a game-winning score. They still trailed 14 to 10, but it could have been worse. Unfortunately for Oakland, two plays later, it did get worse. Bob Swenson intercepted Stabler's highly uncharacteristic careless pass and carted it to the Oakland 17-yard line. Looking at the play from the opposite sideline reveals that all three Bronco linemen were bearing down on Stabler, causing his hurried pass. Number 68, Reuben Carter, number 77, Lyle Alzado, and number 79, Barney Chavis, all got a piece of Stabler. But lest anyone get too carried away with Morton's courageous performance, consider the fact that Stabler has been playing on a knee that may require surgery in the offseason. And it's just as hard to go on a bum knee as it is with a hurting hip. Morton, bad hip and all, took quick advantage of Swenson's interception, looking right before locating heavenly Haven Moses, who made a great diving catch. Moses' stats now read five receptions for 168 yards and two touchdowns. But more important, his second score gave Denver a 20-10 lead with seven minutes left. And still more important was the fact that the Broncos missed the extra point. So instead of needing two touchdowns, Oakland could tie with one touchdown and a field goal. Despite the fact that Denver led by 10, there was no panic in the Oakland offense. Indeed, on an eight-play, 74-yard drive, Stabler called five running plays and completed three passes, all with the clock running, stopping only when Casper made, for him, a routine touchdown reception, again outdueling his linebacker's shadows, outleaping Tom Jackson for six points. Casper's touchdown cut the Bronco lead to 20 to 17, and the game still had over three minutes to go. Certainly enough time for the Raider offense to move into field goal range, if they could stop Denver. Just get two first downs and we'll win, Craig Morton told his charges in the huddle, and on two Lonnie Perrin runs, the Denver offense got half the quota. Two more Perrin plunges rang up the biggest play of the game. Third and three, a minute and a half left. The Broncos trying like mad to hold on to the ball. The Raiders dying to get their hands on it. Otis Armstrong's run carried the Broncos a lot further than the four yards he gained. Oakland was forced to use its last timeout with 47 seconds left, and Denver ran out the clock and ran into Super Bowl 12. The Broncos' 20-17 victory in the AFC Championship game continues a dream season for all those under the spell of Bronco mania. Denver successfully made it to the big one in their first appearance in the postseason playoffs. 
and in Red Miller's first season as head coach of the Broncos. They now get a shot at the NFL title against the NFC champion Dallas Cowboys. For the Raiders, their reign as world champions is over, but they wore their crown well, said Red Miller. Don't take anything away from the Oakland Raiders. They're a great team, but we were just a little bit better, and that's how it goes in the big ones. I wonder if they believe we're for real. I guarantee you we are. All that's left is to prove it to the Cowboys in Super Bowl 12, and nobody, but nobody will be able to argue that point.